Hello everyone, Carlos here. So in today's video, we're going to go over Sysmo installation. We're going to go over the executables that we get from this is internals website. What are the different parameters that we can use in those executables and what are some of the best practices that we should follow when we are installing Sysmo on, on different systems. In addition to that, we're going to go also a bit into the different details of what does it actually it's doing on that host that we're installing Sysmo on. So let's get to it. So we're going to start here on a system that I recently downloaded Sys Sysmon into. I decompressed that zip file that we get from the Sys internals website. Now, one of the caveats is that I'm running as administrator on this box. That is very important. Remember, we're modifying this box. So it's important that any action that we take is as administrator. So let's start with the files themselves that I just downloaded from the Sys internals website, is that we're going to be getting three executable files. One of them is going to be sysmon.exe, which is an x6, x86 file that actually has the x64 version embedded into it. If we look right now at the size, one of the things that we can notice is that it's double the size of the sysmon64.exe. So when we use this executable, this executable is going to work on both x86 and x64 systems. We have an x64 only version, which is sysmon64.exe. And in addition to that, we have sysmon64a, which stands for ARM. So if we're running on ARM systems, we can use this version of sysmon on those systems themselves for that specific architecture. So let's take a look at the sysmon executable and what are the different parameters that I can work with. So if I type sysmon.exe and I don't give it any parameters, I'm going to just be getting the help information. When I look at this help information, what do I have? I have the parameter minus I, which is a parameter that we're interested in, which is the parameter for installation itself. Optionally, we can specify our configuration file right here. Now, in a real world environment, I do not recommend that you use XML files because attackers and red teamers are going to be able to read that file and process that information and find gaps. And they're going to very quickly, if they find Sysmon in the system, they're going to go after the registry key and the registry keys in the configuration field, as we will see. It's going to include the path of that file, and they are going to be able to find that very quickly and determine what are the different filters that you have implemented in that environment. Now, we, get, we have for configuration, the minus C, where we can specify configuration. We have minus M, so we can install the manifest if we want to process EVTX files from another system, which is running Sysmon, and we don't want to install Sysmon on our box just to be able to read those files themselves and get all of the structure inside of the event viewer. Also, we have the minus S, which is for printing the schema. As you guys are going to see, we're not only going to be using this specifically to look at the configuration schema for the XML, but we're also going to be using this to be able to look at the different parameters that are not shown here in this help information. In addition to that, we have sysmon minus U, which allows us to uninstall sysmon from a system. And we also have the optional parameter of force. Now, if we want to look at more parameters, as I mentioned, the best way of doing that is just going straight into the schema itself. So let's take a look here and I'm going to run sysmon minus s. I'm going to pipe this into more. So we're going to be paging to allow us to go through the output itself. Now, when we look at different parameters, we're going to see that we have some extra ones here. For example, we have no logo. No logo is not show the logo itself. And we have also a bunch of different other configuration parameters that we can actually use. So at the, uh, during installation, we can apply some basic configuration if we want outside of the default one. Now, when we look at Sysmon itself, when we use the minus I parameter, the actions that are going to be taken on the system is that it's going to decompress and save a driver and a copy of itself into the system root it's going to register a manifest. It's going to create the services that is needed to load the driver. In addition, the service that is going to process 
all of the information that it's able to get from that driver. In addition to that, if we don't specify a configuration file, it is going to apply a default configuration for us. This default configuration is going to be process creation, process termination, driver load, file creation, time change, and it's going to use SHA-256 for all images. So that is a very solid configuration if you ask me. If you remember, previously when we were talking in the previous video on MITER and coverage, and we were looking at the attack navigator, and we we're looking at all the different sources, one of the things that we noticed is that Sysma had a very good coverage. More than two thirds of all of that coverage actually came from process metadata. Because an attacker, when they're running code, at some point or another, they're going to be running a process on the machine and executing code on it. Just that default configuration itself is going to give us great coverage on that host machine. The different parameters that we have, and if we want to do a simple installation, is sysmon minus i. And as always, we have to accept the EULA. Now we have two other parameters that we can use if we want to hide our installation of sysmon to an attacker that may be looking for it. We have the minus D where we can specify driver name. Now it's limited to eight characters. In addition to that, we can rename the executable itself that we're using for the installation. And that executable is going to be taken as the service name. Now we have to be very careful. And the main reason for this is that when we execute Sysmon itself, we have to keep track of what name we're actually using. If not, we're going to be getting a bunch of errors. So do have process in place, test, and be cautious when you do the renaming of the executable itself to hide the service. Let's do an installation on the machine that we currently have over here. Clear the screen, I'm going to do sysmon minus i dash accept EULA. I'm going to accept the license. And we're going to see that sysmon installed. So that means I had copied the different files. It installed the driver. So it created that service for the driver. Then it created a it started that. So the driver is loaded into memory. Then it created the sysmon service itself and it started that service. So let's go a bit more into the different details on what actually happened there. If we're running an x86 version of Sysmon on x64 system, what is going to happen is that it's going to extract the x64 version into the temp directory. Then it's going to copy that into WinThere. Then it's going to extract the driver into WinThere itself. And it's going to use the WEV util to install the manifest. Now it's important for us to know that the WEV util is being used here for doing that installation. Why? Because this is one of those binaries that attackers like to call lull bins, like they're living off the land. They're going to be using that to clear event logs. They're going to be using that to take other actions in the system if they have admin privileges. So knowing that that executable is also used during the sysmon installation provides great value for the SOC so they don't get false alerts. Now we're creating a service. We're creating the driver, the, the driver itself. We're generating our default config that is being saved into the registry. We're loading that driver, and then we're starting the service. Now, if we're working with any of the 64-bit versions and a 64 system, the steps are the same. The only difference is that we are not going to be decompressing a copy inside of the Windows directory itself. Now, once the driver is loaded, the driver is going to register kernel notification callbacks, so it's able to catch some of the different actions at the kernel level. It's also going to load a mini filter driver on all volumes. So it has access to all of the actions that pertain to the file system and name pipes by using this mini filter driver. Here we have some examples where one of the things that I did is I installed a, the Mimikatz driver, and then I used the different kernel commands to look at the different callbacks that are available. And here we can see that Sysmon actually registered itself for some of the process callbacks. Here we can see that Sysmon also registered itself for registry, for image, and for threat information. So I have all of that information right there available to me. Now, when that mini filter driver loads, what happens is that 
that mini filter driver is going to set itself between the file system and the Windows API. So as the Windows API is issuing read, write, open commands, that Sysmon driver is going to be looking at that information and that driver is going to have an altitude number. Now, one of the things that we do need to be aware of is that if we have multiple security products, each different security product that is actually using a mini driver has their own altitude number assigned by Microsoft. And if they take a blocking action and their driver number is lower than the one from Sysmon, Sysmon's not going to see what actually happened. I've seen this brought before me by multiple customers that all of a sudden, hey, I'm running Simon Tech, I'm running CrowdStrike, I'm running Sentinel-1, and I'm seeing that one of them triggers on some action and the others do not. What is actually happening is that they are having also mini filter drivers and they have different numbers. So when one of them actually triggers on a rule and it has a lower altitude number, the other products are not going to see it. That is one of the caveats of actually running multiple security products on a single box. Um, so yeah, you're actually kind of like not getting full coverage as you expect by adding and adding and adding more security products. In the case of Sysmon, what we're actually doing is that we're enhancing our capability. We're just finding gaps that may be missing from some of those security products and enhancing our analytics as we're going through that. Now, the information is going to be saved inside of the registry itself. So everything's going to go into HK Local Machine System Current Control Set Services, and we're going to have Sysmon and Sysmon Driver. Sysmon being the service itself, and the Sysmon driver is the one that is going to specify the altitude number, and also it's going to hold the configuration for us. Now, when we look at the Sysmon driver, we're going to have two parameters that we're interested in under the parameters key, and those are going to be the hashing algorithms that have been set. And if we specify a rules, we're going to find those groups and filters as a binary blob under rules. Now, one of the things I have to say to you guys is, as somebody who writes offensive tooling for our red team and our pen testing team, if you're an attacker and you go after that binary blob and you don't have the information about what is the specific version of Sysmon that that blob is actually going to go after, it is a pain to actually parse that binary blob and determine what are the different groups and filters that are being applied there. Uh, this is why I mentioned to you guys that just going over there and applying the XML and leaving the XML on disk, leaving that XML in a share that can be accessed by the attacker, it's not a very good idea. We want to add cost to that attacker. And that's why I actually recommend that it's just better to just deploy a registry binary blob to different machines to raise that cost level a bit higher. Now, if we want to apply that configuration file, if we want to, one of the ways that we can do that is we can just do sysmon minus x minus i for installation with set the eula minus c, and we can apply the configuration file. Also, if we want, we can also, and we just want to do an installation, I can do minus c to say, hey, sysmon for configuration, uh, take some of additional parameters, and I, then I do minus H. I can specify the hashing algorithms that I want. I can specify SHA-1, SHA-2, MD5, import hash table, or just all of the different algorithms that I have available for me. Also, if I want to enable revocation, uh, checking revocation for the signatures of the images, I can actually do that. I can just do minus C, minus R to check for revocations as I'm doing the installation. Now we have multiple parameters that we can also use for applying some basic configuration to the machine. I can apply for network connection, image load, process access, but I'll be completely honest to you. In my experience, customers do not use this that much. It's mainly used for research troubleshooting, you might say. If I want a quick config to do a quick test, I'll probably do this, but in actual production, I'll be honest, I haven't seen it. Now, one of the ones that I see debated quite a bit is, hey, when we're doing the installation, 
do we want to hide the driver or, and do we want to hide the service name? I'm going to be perfectly honest with you. It works. Now you're going to hear some people debate. Hey, if I really want to find Sysmon, I can find it. Yes, if you really want to target specifically for Sysmon. Now, there's this conundrum for attackers that when we are performing a pen test, we're performing a red team engagement, um, or we're doing any type of offensive action, one of the things that happens is that we want to reduce our, our detection service. You know, you have your attack surface that an attacker can see and attack that. For the on the attacker side, they have a detection surface. The more stuff I put that doesn't look normal inside of binary, the more attention it attracts from EDR products and AV products, or from a blue team actually going and reverse engineering the payload itself. So typically that initial payload that goes in, that first stage tends to be as simple as possible. We're just looking for some lists of processes, lists of services. We may check a couple of registry keys, but now as we're attacking more stuff to get that initial situational awareness, what is going to happen is that we're going to raise more flags that are going to make an automated system or somebody performing reverse engineering by hand on that binary. Because if I use FLTMC.exe, if I'm running as administrator or I have, I have Mimikatz in memory, one of the things that I can actually do is I can do use the miscellaneous command of MFLT, which is going to list all of those filter drivers. I'm going to be able to see the altitude number. Now you're going to see some blog posts out there actually go and say, hey, I want to hide my Sysmon even better. So I'm going to modify the altitude number. Word of caution, I played with that. And in one time I made the mistake of using the same altitude number as another product and I blue screened the box. So do be careful if you decide to use a different altitude number. Also, as you're using that different altitude number, you may have other products interact differently with Sysmon. So you need to test even more on your installs as you're working with them. So do be aware of that. Yes, that recommendation is there. Yes, it will hide it more. Does it provide a lot more value? I have to be honest, in my opinion, no. But that is a decision that I leave to you guys as you're doing your own installations, your own deployment. You, do, you, you, you can do your own risk analysis to see what you can do there. So now what we're going to do is we're going to do an installation of Sysmon on the system and we're going to hide the driver name. So for this, I'm going to make it look as, as if it is a HP printer driver, for example. So we can do sysmon.exe minus I for installation minus D for the driver name. And the driver name needs to be eight characters long. It cannot be longer. I'm going to do HPQ DRV. We do our installation, and one of the things that we're going to see is that the service itself is still named Sysmon, but the driver right now is named HPQDRV. Now, if we do FT, FTLMC, FLTMC.exe, and we list the filter drivers, we're going to notice that the altitude number remains the same. Now, let's do an install. I'm going to do sysmon.exe minus u. Now let's say that we want to actually just hide both the service and the driver itself. For that, we need to rename the executable. So the way that we would do that is, in my case, I would do copy item sysmon.exe. I'm going to name it hpqprn. Dot .exe or H HP printer. So now I'm going to install with HP PRN.exe. And I'm going to rename also the driver to HPQ PRN. Let's put a D for driver. 
at the end. So one of the things that we see now is that the service was actually installed as HPQPRN and the driver itself was HPQPRND. I've quickly caught myself on an error there. Uh, and I added that D since both of these are services. So one is of type service, the others of type driver. They're created under the same registry key. If I would have named both the same, we would have probably encountered an error and had problems. So that is another gotcha that you need to be aware of and careful of. Now, an attacker can also check the altitude number straight from the registry. In fact, they can even do it as a regular user, but they'll have to kind of like go through every key that is under current control set services and check for that altitude number. As I mentioned before, depending on the security products, that is going to look off behaviorally and it will get a red teamer or an attacker, a real world attacker is going to get them caught if they're, they're trying to do that. Now, some better ways to actually check if Sysmon's there is just to check for win event, the channel itself, because I cannot change that because then it will break SIM solutions as they're trying to pull the data. Also, Microsoft and their EULAs. <laughs> so one of the things that's going to happen on their HK current user software for the user that is doing the deployment, uh, under sys internals, we're going to see system monitor actually be present there. Now, if an attacker is leveraging WMI or the service control manager just going through the registry, one of the things that we're going to notice is that the service description remains as system monitoring service. You can change that as part of your installation. That is just a simple description text field that you can change it to whatever you else want to hide Sysmon itself. That one, I do recommend that you implement that. That is a low risk one. And you can add that as a post installation script. Now, an attacker, if an attacker is able to run under local admin privileges, the, that ability that Sysmon gives us of updating Sysmon itself without a reboot means that the driver needs to be unloaded. So if I'm able to run as administrator and I'm able to identify the driver itself, I can use FLTMC.exe or I can use the APIs itself in memory and I can unload the Sysmon driver. That will actually blind Sysmon to the different actions that are being taken on that system. Now, if I want to un uninstall Sysmon, the way I would uninstall Sysmon is with the minus U. Now, if one of the files is locked, somebody has the event viewer open, or uh, one of the things that may happen is that Sysmon will not be able to remove that file. You can actually force that the removal of all files by just doing Sysmon minus XE minus U force. And that will actually remove Sysmon from the system. Now, some installation best practices. Verify that the version that is on target is the one that you want to change. The best way that I found is just to write a simple PowerShell script to do this. I'm going to go right now to my box. And if you go into the Sysmon community guide, go under the chapter of configuration. I have a sample deployment script that I wrote in PowerShell. In addition to that, I have even examples on how you can deploy that binary blob to the registry itself for the configuration. I have some of the different step-by-steps on how you can do that. As I mentioned, this will make the life of an attacker a lot more difficult for them to be able to abuse Sysmon itself. Another thing that you can actually do is that we can use WMI filters on our GPOs. So it only so that way that configuration only applies to the version of Sysmon that we want on the target machine. Now, one of the caveats and one of the things that I would recommend that you be careful with is that uh, if you're using alternate credentials, those credentials are going to be stored under the context of system on the machine and there are steps for you to retrieve those. You're using DPAPI. If you remove that run one scheduled task and you're using alternate credentials, okay, cool, it's not there in task manager under the store of system, those credentials are not removed. They're always going to be there. An attacker can actually find those and reuse those for lateral movement or for other actions in your system. 
so yeah, so we now did the installation. I went through the different steps, uh, uh, different options in terms of parameters, what is actually happening behind the scenes. As I always recommend with Sysmon, do test, check, validate. And again, I hope that you found this information useful. Remember to like and subscribe. Uh, do leave me comments. And if you want to contribute, remember, go into the Sysmon community guide, contribute there. Let's expand the community. And thanks again for your time.